Good morning, or um, maybe almost afternoon. So Thomas talked about the hero's journey, and that's one of my favorite models to talk about change. And I want to take us on a journey this morning too, but a little bit of a different one. I'm going to take us on a journey way back to the past for a moment, and then I'm going to take us forward into the not-too-distant future. Um, so one of the things that it seems like every time I turn around the last uh, few months I hear is this phrase, secular shifts or secular change. And after a while, I, I actually stopped and realized I don't actually know what that means. I mean, kind of contextually, I could figure it out, but what, what's the definition? So I went and looked it up, and you know, one of the definitions is um, something that occurs just once in an age or in a century, and it's a durable, permanent change, not a cyclical change. And I don't think that definition works anymore. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why. But if we go back um, and put what's happening in AI and all the innovation that we're, we're living through right now, which I think hopefully creates a little bit of goodness and excitement in our industry, um, I want to go all the way back to the printing press. And if you kind of think about you know, these secular shifts that have occurred kind of from the beginning of, of history, um, you know, probably one of the biggest ones was the printing press and just changed the whole world. And then uh, we, we had this thing called the Jacquard loom. How many people have heard of that? All right, JB. So the Jacquard loom uh, really helped us automate textile production, but kind of the spinoff from that was it used punch cards, which then ended up being a key part of computing as we kind of uh, got into the computer age. Um, it also spawned the Luddite movement, which were people who you know, were sure that you know, it was the end of life as we know it and all their jobs were going to go away and people went around smashing these looms uh, as a way to protest. You know, and then the computer and the internet, cloud computing, and now AI. And if you, know, if you think about these, one of the defining factors is those things are getting really much closer together than they used to be. A you know, long time between the printing press and the card loom, long time from there to the computer, and now we're just on this path of acceleration. But one of the things is I've spent a lot of time thinking about AI and my role leading our rollout in support at Microsoft is, it's really not new. And we kind of talk about it like it just suddenly appeared 10 months ago, but you know, AI actually started in around 1956. That's actually when the, the term artificial intelligence was coined. And it started out really focused on expert systems. And so you know, the first AI was about how do we build these expert systems that can answer you know, questions, diagnose illnesses. And that didn't really pan out. And so we ended up in what's you know, kind of called the, the winter of AI in the 80s, early 90s, where um, it kind of was abandoned and we'd kind of given up hope. And then late, late 90s, around 97, there was a shift to this idea of natural langu language models, machine learning, and neural nets. And that's really what's carried us forward into the current uh, place we're at now. Um, in the early 2000s, we started seeing some of these natural language models that resulted in Siri, Alexa, anyone remember Cortana? Um, you know, my favorite. Um, you know, and, and we really all started to integrate AI into our lives. So we've been using AI just in our daily lives for a very long time, but it feels like it's brand new. And then um, GPT-3, which is really the foundation for uh, ChatGPT um, when it was first released, that was released in 2020. So again, not really new technology. And in fact, in my business, we were using GPT-3 models to you know, help with self-help and really help our customers with um, intent determination as they submit incidents. So I think it's just helpful to put all this in context and realize that it's really not as new as we think. Um, the problems are also not new. So with each of these secular shifts came tons of excitement, and everyone thought, you know, this is the best thing ever, and it's going to revolutionize the world, and fear. You know, it's a catastrophe, and we're all going to lose our jobs. Um, neither of those happened, um, as, as you well know. Um, but what did happen is they did fundamentally change the way we work. They fundamentally changed the way we experience the world. So there will be a big shift, but it's going to be somewhere in the middle. There will be challenges, and there will likely be some negative consequences, and there's going to be a lot of good. Um, you know, our role and our responsibility is to make sure that AI is used predominantly for you know, the benefit of everyone and that we protect everyone's fundamental rights as we go down this path together. You know, there's 
really three areas that I keep top of mind as I'm leading this. And as you know, all of us in this room who are likely to be leading different initiatives around AI, I think it's really important um, to get past the hype and get past the technology and think of some of these bigger issues for um, humanity. So there's societal and ethical issues. There's, there's a lot of change that is going to happen and impact people. And it's going to fundamentally change the size and shape of our workforce. You know, so the societal and ethical issues are just mirrored. Um, we all think about AI ethics and the question of bias, the question of, you know, the, the inherent bias in doing labeling and doing classification. Um, this really brings to the forefront uh, an age-old problem of equal access to technology across the world and for all people. And we've got to think about those things. I also just recently read a, a fantastic book that was written a couple of um, years ago called The AI Atlas. And um, it's written by a, a senior principal researcher at Microsoft. I actually bought the book not realizing that uh, the author was, uh, was at Microsoft. But she talks about you know, even bigger issues, uh, issues for the planet. You know, as we add GPU capacity and we build data centers, you know, the mining that we do to, to get um, rare earth metals and the amount of, of energy that we consume in the data centers is going to become a real problem for us and for the planet. And again, we have to be thinking about these things. Microsoft has been working on data centers that are submergible that will actually sink to the bottom of the ocean and will get cooling um, kind of through that versus, you know, using enormous amounts of power. Um, there's also impact to our um, labor force, and not just the obvious ones. We all think about, you know, people's jobs being eliminated or needing less resource. That one's kind of obvious, but, you know, one that I hadn't thought about is there's, there's massive amounts of low-paid or underpaid workers helping, you know, train these models, do classification, um, helping to do reinforcement learning. And, you know, that's another problem that, you know, to me, we have to factor into the overall cost of AI and we have to solve as a society and as leaders in the industry. Um, the human change, you know, every one of us is going to experience a fundamental change in how AI um, impacts our everyday lives beyond what we've already seen. And, you know, we can't take that for granted. And we have to really think about how we get people through that and, you know, again, ensure that every person has equal access and that we're um, applying this responsibly. Uh, Microsoft has really been at the forefront of thinking about this since we started working on AI with our responsible AI framework, our six principles. And then, you know, workforce impacts that I think are very relevant to folks in this room in the service and support industry. Uh, all of us leverage outsourcing in some form or fashion. And increasingly, I'm been leveraging outsourcing, not so much in a traditional sense of reducing cost, but to create flexibility in my workforce, because I know there's going to be continued efficiency gains. I know that, you know, as I get AI deployed, um, I'm going to need less people, and I'm going to need different people. And so, you know, that's a way to avoid um, the very painful reductions that we saw across the industry, but it's not. We've just pushed those, you know, one step out. And, you know, in my mind, I, I actually think we're going to see a crisis in, you know, the outsourcing space in the BPO industry where, you know, we suddenly um, are able to automate much of the work that we've really relied on our, our partners to deliver. And to me, again, that's something we have to think about and solve together. It's not a problem we can just push out to someone else and ignore. So, you know, these are the things that I think we have to all be thinking about as leaders. So this is the closest I'm going to be to talking about, you know, something today real and, uh, you know, really delivering business impact. But every company needs an AI strategy. That may seem obvious, but, you know, I, as I, I work within Microsoft and I talk to my peers, either here at uh, TSIA during our board meeting or over the last several months, um, what I hear is, you know, outside of us who are very close to this, everyone thinks it's magic. It's kind of like cloud computing. You just put stuff in the cloud, it works, you don't have to worry about it. And AI isn't magic. We all know that. And it's not really a technology problem. The technology we have right now is sufficient to solve and, and deliver almost anything we can imagine. It's first and foremost a huge change management and business process reengineering problem. And we have to be creating a strategy across people, data, and knowledge particularly. Um, it's just imperative that you have a centralized, cohesive, coherent data strategy. 
Um, and almost all of us are now kind of regretting um, our underinvestment in knowledge. That was a big topic as we got together this week to talk about, you know, kind of where we're all at on AI. And knowledge was that thing you kind of always, you know, knew was important, but maybe didn't put enough uh, investment in. Well, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? If we don't have the knowledge to stay clean, if we don't have the processes to continue to create and maintain knowledge, we're not going to get optimal benefit. Um, you know, people go through this technology change curve. Um, you know, there's fear, there's denial, there's, you know, hopefully acceptance, but everyone's at a different place there, and we can't be underinvested in the people element of change either. It's critically important that we land that. The last thing that, you know, I hear when I talk to peers, and I've also spent a, a fair amount of time with a couple of different management consulting firms who are out on the sort of leading edge of helping customers implement this technology, is everyone wanted to get out the gate fast. And, and you know, I can certainly say that's true for Microsoft and for my organization. We've been um, implementing the Copilot technology that uh, we just GA'd uh, for service management for months. And I've got it deployed to 35,000 support agents, both internally and with my partners. We're out the gate. And I think a lot of companies were eager to get out there. And what I'm hearing is everyone sort of does that and then comes to a screeching halt as they realize that it's not a technology problem. And they realize it's not just about getting some technology deployed, but it's really about this fundamental business process reengineering. It's about changing the culture. It's about thinking about, you know, what's going to change in the roles that we need? What different skills do we need with our people? Um, you know, it's not about just throwing technology out there and it working. Um, you know, the other thing that's really important to think about is this idea of people plus AI. And at Microsoft, we, we passionately and fundamentally believe that the magic is when AI augments human capability and increases our agency, not decreases it. And we have to really guard against you know, that scenario where it actually decreases our agency and we think AI on its own is going to solve all the problems. At the same time, we do see a future, particularly as we think about support, where I think there's an opportunity to fundamentally change the entire paradigm of how we support customers. And one of the ways I think about this is sort of what we've seen in the aviation industry over many years. So if you think about um, you know, the idea of a co-pilot in aviation you know, that was there to kind of help the pilot, it became you know, automation. And now when you get on a commercial airline, the pilot's not flying the plane. It's autopilot flying the plane. But there's still a pilot there, right? This is a human plus AI kind of model. But increasingly, the pilot's there to interact with the passengers. They're there if something unexpected happens. They're there to ensure safety, but they're, they're in a secondary role. And we do see AI technology, even with co-pilot, kind of going down that path of evolution where AI increasingly can lead. It can really take us through the troubleshooting process. It can have the deep, deep technical knowledge and understanding of our platform. And the role of the human in that is very, very different. And we've got to start thinking about that as now, building the skills, building the readiness to get there, or we're going to find ourselves caught short and surprised. So now I want to kind of shift gears a bit. That's, that's where we're at today. How many of you have been paying attention to quantum computing and kind of know what the current state of technology is in quantum computing? Wow, two or three hands, I'm impressed. That's more than I expected. I guess I don't even need to ask my next question then, which is how many of you woke up this morning worried about how you're gonna be ready for quantum computing and particularly what you need to do to be ready for the risks that quantum computing is gonna create for the industry? I think a hand, you win. I wish I had a prize. Um, you know, I, I'm probably a little bit geeky about this because I, my undergraduate degree is in physics and I really always love quantum computing and quantum in general, but this is, to me, the biggest, most disruptive change that's coming, and it's coming at a rate that I don't think anyone actually truly understands. Quantum computing is going to take sort of the revolution and, that we've seen with AI, and one, it's going to accelerate that to just new scenarios that we can't even think of today, but it has just fundamental applications in logistics, in pharmaceuticals to, to help develop new drugs, in material science. Uh, quantum computing allows us to solve problems that today would take hundreds of years 
with our classical computing, even with the, the huge capability we have, the scale cloud computing, high performance computing, and solve them in minutes. 100 years to minutes. And that's cool. And so you might ask, well, what's the risk? Um, imagine waking up one morning and your bank account's empty. Everyone's bank accounts are empty. Um, all of our encryption no longer works. If anyone watched Mr. Robot, you'll recognize the, uh, the picture uh, on the screen. And, you know, while that's not exactly what happened there, the outcome would really essentially be the same. The collapse of all of our financial markets, everything that we protect with encryption now being completely open. And that's the, that's the other promise of quantum computing. Um, all of our encryption today fundamentally relies on the problem of factoring really large numbers. And it's secure because with our current classical computing technology, that would take literally millions of years. There is no algorithm that can do it faster than that. There's an existing algorithm that's been around for a long time and has been simulated and tested um, for quantum computing called Scholl's algorithm. Scholl's algorithm can factor the current keys for public key encryption in seconds. So the, the moment there's a scale quantum computer, all of our encryption is at risk. Just, just sit with that for a moment. It's, it's the thing that keeps me awake way more than AI destroying the world. And no one's really talking about it broadly. Um, there has been a lot of uh, thought about this. Microsoft's actually been uh, one of the leaders, along with many other companies that I'm sure in the room, HP Enterprise is, is also doing a lot of cutting edge research in quantum computing in developing something called post-quantum encryption. Uh, it, the, the effort sort of in the US and even globally is to a great extent being led by the National Institute of Science and Technology. And there are viable algorithms. Uh, we've contributed five different algorithms that are backwards compatible even for TLS and, and other standard encryption methodologies. But think about how distributed our security infrastructure is. Think about all the places globally and all the systems where public key encryption is used. Look, we can't even get customers to update Windows or their Exchange servers. Thomas talked about you know, the too much fish still on the menu. We can't you know, really get ourselves migrated from on-prem to the cloud. How are we gonna go get every computer, every server, every service on the planet updated to use post-quantum encryption? It's a really big problem, and this is something we have to start thinking about today because we're close. Um, in order to, to run Scholl's algorithm, you'd probably need about a million stable qubits, and qubits are the, the basic unit of quantum computing. You can kind of think about them like a transistor or a bit in a computer. Um, today, that's, that's probably about 1,000, 10,000 10, times uh, greater scale than what we have today. And getting to that scale requires a, a fundamental breakthrough in physics. Well, that happened this year. We published a paper um, in the Journal of Physical Science that's got peer-reviewed data that, that sh demonstrates the ability to get that level of scale and stability with something called topographical qubits. So that was one breakthrough, and it fundamentally shifted the problem of getting to scale quantum computing from being a physics problem to being an engineering problem. And we know how to solve engineering problems. The other big problem with quantum computing is interfacing the quantum computer back into our, our normal classical world. Um, and we've also made significant progress on that. Our researchers working with some folks from the University of Sydney have actually um, built a controller for quantum computers that sits on the same wafer at the same supercooled temperature as the, the qubits and really opens the door to scale interfacing because really the interfacing was the other part that was limiting uh, our ability to make progress. So what does that mean? What it means is that things that were really truly science fiction before March when we published this paper now aren't. Um, I used to think we'd see quantum computing, you know, sort of when my kids were my age and maybe next generation, but this is something that I'm now seeing people talk about 2026. 
That's not a long way away. And so we have to start thinking about both the opportunity. How are you going to apply this kind of technology in your business? While the obvious applications are in science and research, there are some really compelling opportunities to use this to solve large business problems. And then how are we going to go get after this problem of post-quantum um, encryption? Because if we don't, um, I don't think we're going to like the outcome. So, you know, we kind of started in the past and talked about printing presses and jacquard looms, came forward to AI, which is going to change the world, probably not as dramatically either way as we think in the short term, but I do think it's going to have a very, very real effect. Satya, our CEO, um, recently uh, shared with us that, you know, when he thinks about AI and what's going on, kind of reflecting back on his experience in the industry, he thinks we're going to see the same change that cloud computing um, has kind of gone through over the last 10 to 15 years over the next year, maybe two. So this acceleration, and then when you think about quantum computing layered on top of that, and the fact that it's gone from being this far off sort of fantasy to something that's real, and we know how to go get after the engineering problem to build it, um, we all better buckle our seats because um, change is coming at a pace that we've never dealt with and it's going to be really fundamental secular shifts that come one after another. So, you know, just to kind of sum up, um, you know, my goal was to just, you know, sort of get us thinking about preparing for the future today. Um, and there's, you know, three things I'd love you to take away from this. One is scaling AI is not a technology problem as much as all of our um, engineering folks at our companies would like to think. It, it really is a human problem, a process problem, a data problem, a change management problem. The, the tech is actually relatively easy at this point. So uh, we've got to really have a strategy and we've got to be focused on those changes that have to happen to enable us to get value from AI. Otherwise, it's a cool technology, but another one of those that doesn't actually deliver the promise and the value we expect. We have to balance the short-term impact with the longer-term paradigm shifts. And, you know, again, the, the key word there is balance. Um, I've seen two sort of extremes here, but not much in the middle. One extreme is we want to go after the big prize. I think TSIA just recently published a, a framework for AI that talks about you know, things that are below the water and at the waterline and above the waterline, with the things above the waterline being those hard things that are going to take time to develop and time to materialize in terms of value, if at all. A lot of companies just want to go straight after those. And you know, that's a suspect strategy because you, you may make a lot of investment and not get there. It also prevents you from actually doing the work on the fundamental things that you need to do to make those real. On the other hand, if you just go after the low-hanging fruit, you know, we've got case summarization running. We've had it since day one because you kind of get it for free when you, you know, implement a large language model. You know, we've, we're getting some impact from that, but it's not going to get us where we want to go. So we can't just stay e there either. So we are kind of thinking about three horizons, you know, kind of the immediate low-hanging fruit. What are the next set of scenarios we can start building that we can kind of envision now? And then how do we just throw away everything we think about supporting customers and delivering service? All the boxes, you know, submit case, troubleshoot, resolve, communicate. Just throw it out. And think about what would that look like if we just reimagined it with AI? And that's kind of our third horizon, but that's going to take time. We've got to get the fundamentals right. We've got to get people on board. But we're going to work on those in parallel. They're not sequential. And so this balance of the short term to get impact and probably create funding with the long term is really important. And then finally, prepare for quantum now. I know it seems, you know, kind of like it's an out there thing, but I'm telling you it's not. And we're gonna see acceleration there, very similar to what we saw in terms of acceleration with AI. We're gonna kind of you know, look the other way and suddenly we're gonna turn around and here's a quantum computer at scale and we've gotta deal with these problems. And again, I'm just chastened by you know, the conversations we've had in these rooms at these conferences for years and years and years about the inertia and the you know, resistance to change across our industry and just how hard it is just to do you know, fairly simple changes. This is huge. So lots to think about, lots that's exciting. You know, I want to end, you know, not in the gloom and doom, but really in, you know, what a cool time to be here and what a cool time to be in this industry because service and support is actually one of the most obvious places to get huge impact and huge benefit for our businesses and our customers from this technology. 
but we're only gonna get that benefit if we're ready, if we're thoughtful, and we keep the future in mind as well as looking past and learning from the past. Thank you.